Dana. How are you? You're muted, so you need to unmute. So hi everyone, I'm Sukrita. A couple of housekeeping notes is we've been doing through the day. Um, we're recording all these sessions and we're gonna have the videos ready for, for you uh, in a week. Um, I saw some of you asking questions about the previous sessions. We'll also have the slides for you to be able to view. Um, please share the fun that you're having whether it's through the content or selfies of your viewing party or you watching at your desk um, on social media using the hashtag GGX Elevate. We're gonna do Q&A at the end if we have the time. So please post your questions. Um, at the bottom, there's a button for Q&A. If we don't have time for it, we'll do it over social media. And I'm sure Dina will be willing to do that for us. Um, also, we have a job board uh, on our website, girlgeek.io slash opportunities. So please check it out. Now our next speaker is Dina. I'm super excited. Uh, she's a software engineer at Sentry where she works on the growth team. Fun fact, she graduated from Hackbright where um, she learned, did a 10 week program studying Python. Um, before that, she's a graduate from Duke University and uh, was working as a research analyst at World Bank. Her talk today is about A-B testing, cheap and easy with open source. And I'm sure everyone's excited to learn more about this. So thank you so much, Dina, for taking the time. Hey, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and bring up my slides. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. OK. Hi, guys. It's so nice to be here with all of you. Happy International Women's Day. Um, today, we're going to be chatting a little bit about A-B testing and specifically how to do it cheap and easy with open source. You can find me on Twitter as Dina Mwangi or on LinkedIn. Um, feel free to connect. So before I jump in, just a little bit about me. As was mentioned, I'm a software engineer at Sentry.io on the growth engineering team. I did go to boot camp, um, and that's how I got into tech. So I went to Hackbright, and I think there are a few Hackbright grads in the audience today. So hi to all of you. Um, I'm also a data enthusiast. I am an economist by training, so I really like thinking about data and- Hey, Dana. Sorry to interrupt you, but you're um, very uh, soft in your volume. Can you speak up or move yes. the mic closer? You may need to start again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is better. This is better? Okay. Thank yeah. you so much for the heads Thank up. Thank you. Awesome. Um, yeah, so software engineer, bootcamp grad, um, studied economics. So I really like thinking about the world in terms of data which is how I ended up in the role that I am in now. I also really like thinking about diversity and inclusion and how to do tech for good. So I really liked the talk that we just had about AI. So if you wanna talk about any of those things, feel free to connect as well. Our agenda for today, we're gonna to go through what and where is A-B testing. We'll talk through um, the general MVP requirements if you want to build your own. And then we'll talk a little bit about Plan Out, which is an open source framework that you can use to help you out. So what is A-B testing? Um, simply put, it's just a way of comparing two or more versions of a thing to determine which performs better. And the magic sauce that lets us do that is we're able to randomly assign samples of people to each variation and use statistical analysis to evaluate how legit our results are. If we do this correctly, we're able to take the insights that we get from our small samples and say something meaningful about our larger population, which is what we're really interested in. You'll also hear this called split testing or bucket testing. Now, where is A-B testing? And the answer might freak you out. It's everywhere. So as you are using your applications, as you're surfing the web, tons and tons of organizations are running A-B tests on us all the time. Um, but for the most part, it's because they wanna make sure that we're getting the best out of their product that we can possibly get. So one example of this is Netflix. So while you're at Netflix and chilling, Netflix is running tons of experiments. One of these is what image they show when you're surfing and trying to figure out what show you wanna watch. So they've played around with the title they show you, the image that they show you, and they run experiments to see which one gets the most clicks and which one ends up with more people watching it. A quick example of that is with a show that I love called Sense8. If you haven't seen it, you should. 
Um, so they ran this when they first had this show out. And this is just three of quite a few um, variations and buckets of this that they experimented with. So you'll notice that they're playing around with the text, they're playing around with the image that they're showing, um, and they set this through all their markets. Um, so if you look at this, try and think about which one of these appeals to you the most. Um, and in the US, if you chose the middle one, then you're in the majority. So most people in the US ended up picking the middle one. So most people who saw this ended up clicking on it and actually watching the show, which is what Netflix cares about. Uh, but as with A-B testing, you'll find that once you start digging into the data, there's often quite surprising insights to be found. So while the middle one did the best in the US, all of these were winners in different markets. So the left one won in Germany, the right one won in Brazil. And this actually tends to make a big difference. So they saw, once they started running these experiments, a 20 to 30% lift in engagement with people clicking on these titles and actually watching their shows. So you can make a difference. One more example oh, for that. Uh, quick note, this stuff is hard. Computers are really hard. They do this with tons and tons of different shows. And this is one where it kind of went awry if you've seen Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. Maybe this is the vibe you get, probably not. But this is a case where they kind of mismatched the image that they were showing in their test. Um, so one other quick example of where A-B testing is, is uh, an example that's kind of famous with Google, where they weren't quite sure which shade of blue they were going to use. And I think things like this are why A-B testing actually has a bad rap, because people think, really, are we going to spend our time thinking about shades of blue? And actually, yeah, we are, because this actually translated by figuring out which one worked the best for their users it translated to an increase of $200 million in ad revenue. So A-B testing can end up being quite profitable. So if I've convinced you that perhaps A-B testing is something that could be useful for your organization, what do you do next? How do you even begin? Um, so let's talk through some of the MVP requirements. Really boils down to two things. You wanna think about how you're gonna bucket people and how you're gonna do it correctly. And the second thing you're gonna to wanna to think about is your data, the data that you're getting out because you need to know which of your variations performs the best. So for the first bit, you wanna think about randomization. You're gonna be randomly assigning your users as they come through, but they're gonna come through your website multiple times, hopefully. Um, and so you want these randomization, these assignments to be deterministic. And counting is hard, so this is a non-trivial task. As you scale out your experiments, you're also going to want to account for parallel or iterative experiments. So if you have a user that is going to be exposed to multiple parts of your site, you want to be very intentional about what you're showing them. As far as the data, you want to think about how you're getting the data out for analysis so you can actually decide who wins. Um, you want to think about how you're linking it to your internal metrics. So like with the Netflix example that we saw, they really care about people actually watching the show and they really care about the people who are paying them, how much they're paying them. So you wanna have a way of linking the success of your experiments to your internal metrics like activation and paid users. Um, and you wanna think about how are you gonna be seeing this? Like, what does your analysis look like? Do you need dashboards to make that easier for you and your team? When we thought about this, we had to make a decision between whether we were gonna build something or whether we were gonna buy something. And there's pros and cons to both of these situations. So with buying, of course, it costs money. That's the downside. These can be pretty pricey. They run up to 40 to 60K sometimes. Um, but on the plus side, they're almost ready out of the box. Bit of a negative is you have to do a little bit of extra work to link them to those internal metrics. And you have to also think about, do you wanna send all your sensitive information about your users out to a third party. If not, which you probably don't want to do, how do you get that information from the experiments back and connected into your internal metrics? As far as building it, the downside is, well, you have to build it. So you have to customize it to your exact use case, which is great, but that takes engineering resources, building and maintaining it. Um, and again, counting is hard. So you have to think about how you're going to be implementing that correctly and validating the results that you're getting. So when we thought about that at our institution, we decided to use open source for the first section, for the first problem of how to bucket people correctly. 
we don't want to think about that. We figured if there was someone who's already done the work of implementing that, why reinvent the wheel? So for the first part, we used open source, but for the second part, we kind of had our data pipeline already in place. And so we were able to leverage our existing infrastructure and just hook that into place. So what did we use? We ended up using uh, an open source framework called Planout. It's Python based and it's from Facebook. It's been around for a few years, so it's had various ports from other teams. For example, um, HubSpot built one for JavaScript. But the best thing about Planout and the thing that really sold us is that it's low entry but high ceiling. So you get the bare minimum to get you started running experiments very quickly, um, but it's extensible. So you're able to scale it out to lots of users and you're also able to have lots and lots of add-ons. So things that you get. You get random operators, you get deterministic assignments for your hashing, you get namespacing. And to do all this, it's really simple. If you're familiar with Python, you're able to create new experiments simply by inheriting from a base experiment class and modifying the, uh, the assignment logic. But what you don't get is you don't get a GUI. So everything is code-based, and every time you want to create a new experiment, you have to write it out in, in code and write it out in Python. Um, you also don't get any post-experiment analysis assets. So the nice dashboards to help make your analysis life easier, those don't really exist, and that's something that you have to implement on your own. So I find it best to learn about a new tool by walking through an experiment. So we're going to walk through a really quick one with a pet adoption profile. So suppose you had an app that was trying to get a pet adopted. Suppose it's this guy. And you think that if you play around with the image that you're showing, you'll be able to have more interest and more clicks on this lovely cat's profile. Um, you also want to have a blurb with it, because why not? So we're going to have these two images and these two blurbs, which gives us four options that we're experimenting and randomly showing to our users as they flow through. If we wanted to run this with plan out and actually have an experiment up and running, this is pretty much all that it would take. It's some code. It's always scary when you see code on your screen, but don't fear. We'll walk through it really quick. Um, so basically what this is, is it just pulls from a simple experiment class from plan out, and it gives you all your random operators all in this one thing. What you have to do on your end is tell it the required rules of engagement. So tell it, what you're trying to do, who you're trying to experiment on. In this case, it would be a user ID. Tell it what you're varying. In this case, we're varying an image and a blurb. Tell it also how you want to vary this. And in this case, we're going to be using uniform choice. We don't really care, 50-50 split with each one. And that's all it really needs to know. But where does this actually go in your code? So if you played around with Flask, for example, wherever it is that you'd be using this image and this blurb, regardless of what language you're using, that's where this would go. So in this case, if you have a route, then you just throw in your assignments and you're able to pull directly from them and put them into your template. But okay, so you did the thing, but where's your data? For this, all you had to do is tell it how to do the logging in your setup. So you tell it where you want to log all the things, what file you want to send it in, whether or not you have a data pipeline or not, you have this option and just throw it into a JSON. So as people are flowing through your website and seeing all the options that you're showing them as you're randomly assigning them into a particular variation, all of this is getting logged and put into a JSON that looks like this that will make it easier for you to pull from it later on. And the important bit here is that you're able to see what the image was that they were assigned and what the blurb was that they were assigned. Also who they are and what time it was, but really these are the two main things that you care about. And that really is it. That's your first experiment and you're ready to go forth and A-B test all the things. But before you do, I will leave you with a few A-B testing sanity tips that we've learned on my team that have made our lives a lot easier. The first being, you really want to have well-defined metrics of success before you start running your experiment. I think a lot of teams get really excited and they think, obviously, this is going to be great. I'm sure it will be a success, but they're not very clear on what success looks like. So before you run any experiment, be very clear to write this down and know what your metrics of success are. The second thing I would advise is to make sure that you're doing 
all your experiments in small measurable iterations instead of doing large sweeping changes. Sometimes this isn't always possible. For example, if you have an experiment that's being run that um, requires a lot of design or it's a very green field, then you might have to do a lot of front end work, a lot of front end cost work. But for the most part, you really wanna be doing this in small measurable iterations. That way you're able to attribute what exactly um, what exactly changed to give you the lift that you might be seeing in your data. Otherwise, it gets very confusing. Was it the button color that you changed? Was it the language that you changed? It's unclear. So do small measurable iterations. Um, the last thing is A-B testing is not a silver bullet. Data is one thing in your toolbox. It's not the entire toolbox. So this really should inform your decisions. It shouldn't be the one guiding light. So if you see a lift in an experiment, for example, you really want to think about it and look at it in context um, of the whole picture of your application and what you're trying to answer. So with the Netflix one, for example, they could have said, oh, okay, this one particular one, one in the US, let's do this everywhere. But instead they dug deep and they were able to dis disaggregate and see that actually they had different winners in different markets and they were able to leverage that information and go forth with that and be a bit more, a bit more successful. Um, Thank you so much for your time. It's been so great um, chatting with you. Happy International Women's Day. If you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. Thank you, Dina. This is amazing. What a fun image at the end. <laughs> um, all right, so there are a few questions, so let's roll through them. Uh, Susan asks, do the logs include the end action? That is the click event of user wanting to adopt the cat. That's a great question. And no, it doesn't. So this really logs the exposure. So you'd have to do the extra step, which is sometimes non-trivial, of having to connect the exposure with the actual action of interest. So what we do is we have lots of different analytics events. Um, so in addition to the exposure one, we think about what we want them to do and what success looks like, and we log that as well separately. And when we run the analysis, then we combine the two. Got it. How do you know what is a good sample size of data to test with? So this actually, there's equations that we run. Um, it's pretty standard, like statistical uh, modeling that you can just like put a number in, figure out what power you want, figure out um, what level of statistical significance you want um, that you're comfortable with and play around with that. And that will spit out what sample size you should be going with at the bare minimum. All right. And is there any project too small for A-B testing to be useful? For example, a small app in private beta with only 20 users? Yes, unfortunately, so with the statistical significance to be able to say something that's truly meaningful, you'd have to run the numbers and see like what the minimum number would be. But I think 20 would definitely be too small. You want something in the hundreds and up. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and finally, what did you find most challenging when you transitioned from boot camp grad to working full time as an engineer? That's a great question. That should be a talk all on its own. <laughs> um, I think for me, it was, it was still like a steep learning curve, but it was getting really comfortable asking questions and asking one more question than you feel comfortable asking and getting over that fear of being seen as not knowing enough or all the imposter syndrome things that come with being a bootcamp grad and being in your first tech role. Um, I think honestly, that was the biggest thing is just getting over that and saying, it's fine. I just need to learn the things. So I'm going to ask my questions. Thank you so much, Dina.